thanks again, everyone, for uh, attending this this class here. And um, yesterday, I felt just a little rushed towards the end, so there, we're going to quickly talk about um, and review a little bit on compressors prior to me handing it over to Kevin. Um, <clears throat> so he, he'll uh, he'll finish up today with uh, in regards to high side components, and then we'll hit tomorrow no, I... with uh, low side components. I'll take I'll take. Uh, control of that meeting tomorrow. But anyway, back to this K-body compressor. This was an air-cooled compressor, as I said yesterday. And how we identify this air-cooled compressor is we have both both the suction and the discharge uh, service valves on one side of the, uh, the compressor. And, and it's mainly located here on the head itself, right? And then um, one thing I didn't talk about yesterday, I, I briefly said that uh, refrigerant Cool compressors. Uh, we have two two types. Okay, we have the air cool compressors and we have the refrigerant cool compressors. Air cool compressors, in and of themselves, have to have a minimum of 650 CFM across the body of the compressor to keep it cool while it's, while it's running. And most of these compressors are located in condensing units where they have fan cycling and stuff and fans themselves. So as the fans um, <clears throat> are not only used for um, condensation or condensing purposes, they also help cool the compressor itself cool. Um, and again, so a minimum of 650 cubic feet per minute of airflow across the body of the body compressor of the to keep it cool. This here is our refrigerant cool compressor. And um, keep in mind, refrigerant comes in through the suction side of the compressor, right? And we talked about how it's uh, how the, the gas separates itself uh, from by the velocity of the gas actually hitting the motor end of the compartment here. And the oil being heavier than the vapor itself actually falls and pools and goes through the oil check valve here and gets sent over to the um, what we call the crankcase side of the compressor itself. And we, won't, we don't get into much detail here in regards to there's there is a pressure drop anywhere from three to four pounds pressure drop between the motor side and the crankcase side of the compressor, which helps push this oil over into the to the uh, crank side of the compressor itself. But what identifies this compressor in comparison to the um, air cool uh, compressors is this this compressor here also has a discharge valve on the, on the head side of the compressor where the suction service valve is either on the end bell or the stator uh, the, the stator cover, or some some of the compressors we have like a 3R, and I believe the e, ER uh, compressors they also they also have a um, suction service valve midway of the compressor itself. Okay, but that's how you can identify the semi hermetics between the two: what is air cooled and what is refrigerant cooled. Again, we talked a little bit about the uh, scroll versus uh, reciprocating uh, compressors that we manufacture. And again, this is a um, this is a uh, uh, like a slide presentation that we use for digital scrolls and how the digital scroll separates. And um, all we need is one millimeter of separation between the tips within the scroll itself, and and it bypasses internally from this portion right here being the uh, the high pressure portion of the scroll, as we head out towards the the uh, outer portion of the scroll uh, itself, then the high pressure pushes out and then heads out to the um, um, the suction side of the compressor right down here. Remember, as I said earlier, yesterday, this is the muffler plate. Anything above the muffler plate is all high pressure. This is all low pressure within the compressor itself. All right, let's see here. What else did I wanted to say about this? Okay. And we also talked yesterday about digital scroll technology and how the digital scroll works, all right? It follows the load in the, um, in the evaporator. And what is load? And <clears throat> what, what I kind of, when I get these classes, uh, a lot of times I kind of, talk about what is load and, and and load is heat in the space that we're trying to trying to cool like in a uh, a theater per se maybe we have 100 people in this theater and it seats 100 people and stuff like that and right before the theater 
turns on, there's no one in the in the space. So I can, if I want to consider load as a percentage, then I could say that we have zero percent load inside that theater itself. Maybe I have a scroll outside, sitting outside that has a digital technology, and we want to. Um, we're trying to follow the load uh, that's being induced on the evaporator that's inside the space we're trying to cool, right? Air conditioning, maybe not so, because we ducked the, um, the, uh, the airflow back from the space into the, or through the evaporator and back down into the uh, space to be cool. <clears throat> so maybe we have 100 people that are sitting in this, um, uh, or uh, we have seats available for this theater and prior to the, the theater, maybe 50 people show up. Um, the compressor itself will sense that 50% load, okay? And what it does is that the, the controller that we have that operates this will sense the pressure on the suction side of the system and will tell the compressor to load or energize and de-energize the solenoid valve that's on top of the, on the, the head of the compressor, all right? All right. <clears throat> so, it's um, um, at 50 percent. Our controllers will will anal analyze the system every 20 seconds, and when it does, it'll it'll make adjustments every 20 seconds. So it says, "All right, we need to load this compressor at 50 percent." So it'll load, turn on the solenoid valve for 10 seconds, um, and de-energize the solenoid valve for 10 seconds. And when it de-energizes the solenoid valve for 10 seconds, what it does is it pushes pressure down on top of this piston which causes the upper scroll set to mate or engage with the uh, orbiting scroll that's, that's attached to the, to, the, um, to the shaft itself, which causes it to uh, pump uh, 100%. Uh, and again, we time average that out. Now, before, um, you know, I was using that theater as, a, as, a, as an illustration um, in Maybe we get 100 people back into that space as load, um, and we're just using people as as a um, as a uh, a means for following load itself in this illustration, right? So we get 100 people that that decide to go into this theater right before the movie starts. So now the compressor loads up at 100 percent, and that that means that this compressor, the solenoid valve, is de-energized for uh, for 20 seconds total. Okay, so we time average that out. Um, and uh, of course, the uh, the compressor follows the load that's happening within that space. Now, if we're looking at freezers or or cooler applications, it's a little bit different. Obviously, I'm just using that as a as an illustration for uh, load itself. Because we'll further in this class, and if you take next week's class, also we'll be talking a little bit more about load. So I just wanted to clarify what that is. <clears throat> One thing nice about this digital scroll technology is we've incorporated this technology into uh, our X-Line condensing units and for the medium temp condensing units. And um, it, next Tuesday we're going to have a, um, I'm going to throw this out now, next Tuesday we're going to have a um, Julie Havner and also Scott Avini is going to give a presentation on the X-Line digital uh, com, um, condensing units that we have, uh, that we rolled out this month actually. So. Uh, you couple one of those digital scroll lines units or the X line units up with one of the new uh, what I call the smart evaporators that have the built-in solenoid, uh, solenoid not the solenoid not the valve, but the built-in um, expansion valve and the and the um, um, the electronic uh, controls that are built into the uh, to the evaporators themselves. What a what a perfect setup that would be. Um, so anyway, if you're here next Tuesday, I encourage that you attend that meeting. It's another, um, it will be another uh, webcast, and um, I think it will be very enlightening. So I'm going to pass it off now over to um, Kevin, um, and then we'll see where is Kevin. I don't see Kevin. Hey Ed, I'm I'm changing him to the presenter, and okay. I'm going to go ahead and unmute Kevin. Okay, Kevin, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, Kevin, you have the ball now. Uh, let's see, I need to share my screen here. Okay. 
There you go. All righty. And let's see, maximize that, right? Okay. This is a refrigeration system. Uh, uh, welcome, everybody. I just uh, started going right at it. Um, this is a refrigeration system that has just about every valve that you can imagine on it. Uh, there's everything around the horn from from an oil separator to uh, you know to a headmaster and on out. I'm going to do all the high side components today, and and hopefully we'll have time for Ed to do. Uh, um, the low side as well, but we'll just see how it turns out. Um, the oil separator, in a supermarket situation where you have a lot of horsepower necessary, they parallel the compressors. In other words, they tie all the discharges together, all the suctions together in, in what they call suction headers, liquid headers, discharge headers. And uh, it, it's all done in the equipment room as far as uh, multiple compressors on a, on a rack system. And so, being as how a compressor is going to pump out a little bit of oil all the time, you need to try to get that oil back to the compressors where it's supposed to be. And, and so, an oil separator is there to wring out that oil from the discharge gas as it leaves those compressors, as it leaves the rack, and divert it back to a reservoir and then uh, back to a uh, um, the compressors themselves. So this is a shot of a supermarket system that's uh, got multiple compressors. These are these are semi-hermetic compressors, and not scroll compressors. And you can tell they're low temp because they have head cooling fans, that kind of thing. But here's your reservoirs. You can see there's a, a sight glass here and a sight glass here. It tells you what the levels are of the oil in the reservoir and that kind of thing. Uh, didn't have a shot of the actual oil separator in this in this picture, but uh, you know it, uh, this kind of shows the medium temp and low temp sides of this rack. And uh, so, if you look at the inside of a oil separator, uh, the simplest of them is this style like this, where your discharge gas comes into the in port and out through that out port. And, it, and what happens here? It's just like Ed was talking about on suction cooled compressors, how it drops the oil out. When you come in here with a with larger size of uh, or a small size pipe, and get into this reservoir, it it has ability to move out for, to the sides and and uh, slow down. When it slows down, it's able to impinge upon this hundred mesh screen and drip down and fill up the bottom of this with oil, both on the inlet and the outlet as the refrigerant is moving slow. Then you've got on the bottom here this little toilet ball float. And you know, this thing is it's like a toilet ball. Basically, when the level rises enough, it, it uh, allows flow through kind of backwards from what the what the toilet does. But but anyway, this is the oil return. And you got to remember that this is all discharge gas inside here. So if we didn't have this ability to shut off that pipe going back to the oil uh, oil reservoirs and, and like that of the uh, system, we'd be feeding discharge gas directly back to the compressors, and that's not good. Uh, so this just proves, basically proves that there's oil in the bottom of the separator and uh, allows it to go back to the reservoir where it's used to uh, to refill the compressors. And the means to refill them is a couple different ways, electronically and uh, mechanically. There's uh, there's this kind of float like this, okay, and, and the, again, that's just a, a little float that's inside of a, uh, a canister that's attached to the side glass on the side of the compressor. And these are adjustable, so you can adjust the height of the of the oil, whether you want a half a side glass or a quarter of a side glass or you know three quarters, whatever. You can adjust the height of that of that float inside there so that it maintains that that level in there. And then this is all fed. All these oil uh, oil controls are fed by uh, a uh, oil line that's going down next to this header. So um, you know that's that's the mechanical way of doing it. Then there's electronics. With uh, scroll compressors, scroll compressors don't have any means to 
test to see what kind of oil pressure they have. In other words, they, they just spin that oil up the center of the crankshaft and it feeds all the bearings. Uh, there's, there's nothing external that you could hook to that would uh, allow you to, to sense whether there's oil pressure or not, unlike the center hermetics and like that, where they have oil failure switches or oil controls on them that uh, would shut off at, at less than nine pounds. These, for the scrolls, uh, basically just prove that there's oil available. So what happens with these guys is uh, if the oil level drops an eighth of an inch below half a side glass, it gives a five second time delay to make sure that it's not gonna just go ahead and come back. And then after that five second time delay, it starts filling. It, uh, the oil fitting right here comes in here and you've got a solenoid on here. So uh, 24 volts is applied there and it, and it energizes that solenoid, opening up the oil inlet and it allows oil into the crankcase of the compressor, filling it back up to a half a side glass. Once it gets to there, it goes to another five second delay. Now, if it can't get there in 30 seconds, then it's going to go into an alarm mode and say, well, I don't have any oil available. So it, uh, it'll alarm. And if it alarms five times in an hour, it'll actually lock out. And that's what saves the compressor if there's a loss of oil uh, in the system. So this is kind of a shot of the old OMAs. Uh, the OMA, with a scroll compressor, you've got to, they wear in instead of wear out. So there are some smaller, very, very, very small uh, metal particles that are ferrous that uh, are picked up by the magnets on this. Uh, there's, there's three magnets on this control that as this float goes up and down, as it, as it rides up and down in the oil uh, level, the magnets are introduced to the sensor over on the side, and it can tell whether it's high or low or directly in the middle. Well, what happens is the metal particles that are floating around in the oil, if they haven't been picked up by a, a, a filter dryer yet, get onto these uh, controls and they drag. And sometimes it'll stay thinking that it's, uh, it's full and sometimes it'll just overfill. So we went to a different design, and this is a much better design in that it's got a little boat here with the magnet on top of this mast. The oil level sits inside here, and it just, as the oil level goes up and down, the sensor up above here senses that, that magnet and can tell whether it needs to fill or not. So a much better scenario uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't have that pivoting area, uh, and it doesn't, uh, doesn't plug up. So while we're talking about oil separation, oil separation in, in its, the best way you can do it or the, or the best uh, oil separators are about 98% efficient. And, you know, in refrigeration oil, sometimes there's moisture. And if 98% of the oil is not getting out to a filter dryer to take that moisture out of the oil, then you have an issue with the oil breaking down. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more later. But uh, uh, the uh, oil will break down. So in the return line, coming back to the reservoir between the, uh, the separator and the reservoir is one of these inline filter dryers. And these are AOFD Alco oil filter dryers. Uh, and they're about uh, 30 cubic inches, something like that. Uh, Three-eighths flare on, on both ends. They have pressure taps on them so you can check the pressure drop across them to see if they're loaded up or not. Uh, and uh, once they, you know, in the springtime, actually, when they start doing their PMs at supermarkets, these are changed out fairly regularly uh, just to get any of that, that uh, moisture that might be in the oil from the service that's gone on for the, the rest of the year. So... Very fine filtration. Uh, I think it's three micron filtration, uh, and uh, there's there's desiccant inside here to pick up moisture, and uh, and very low pressure drop. So you know these things are used a lot in supermarket applications. So the next thing down the line is the headmaster. So 
installed all kinds of things, winter valve, head pressure control valve, Headmaster. Headmaster is actually, I think, a trade trade name or trademark name for Alco controls. Um, but uh, here's how it's piped in. Uh, your standard refrigeration system would come up here and it'd turn and go into the condenser and it'd condense that uh, that hot gas into a liquid and then come back down over here and drop into the into the reservoir, and then the re the uh, oil reservoir or the uh, receiver would uh, come up heating liquid refrigerant over the expansion valve. What this does is it's piped into a bypass line and the condenser line and the receiver line. So hot gas can come up here and introduce itself underneath the, the dome of this headmaster. The liquid that's coming from the condenser comes in through the bottom and turns and goes to the receiver and the pressure of this head uh, of your head pressure changes the amount of flow of liquid refrigerant through there. We're going to look at that right now. If you look at this with an R22 system, um, on a 100 degree day, you're going to have uh, 260 pounds per square inch on your high side. 260 pounds per square inch coming on this bypass line that comes over here and comes down to the headmaster. In this, this case right here, you've got your hot gas is coming into the, the uh, uh, condenser. It's condensing, turning into a liquid. That liquid comes over here, is fed through the headmaster and down the receiver. And internally, what's going on, you've got 260 pounds over 70 pounds. That's, you know, you're trying to maintain a suction pressure. What's going on internally, though, is with 260 pounds discharge coming through here, through this little journal right here, and underneath this dome, it reacts or, or pushes against a nitrogen charge that's in the dome of this, this headmaster. That nitrogen charge is at 195 pounds per square inch. So 260 is higher pressure than 195, so it presses to the right on that diaphragm, holding this poppet closed, and the liquid refrigerant comes through here and goes down to the receiver. So, um, that's giving us a 20 degree TD. It's a 100 degree day. It's 120 degrees condensing. And, uh, you know, we've got a 20 degree TD at 260 pounds per square inch. Now, let's change the day. Let's go to a 60 degree day. We're trying to maintain 100 degrees. Okay, 196 pounds of R22 is 100 degrees. That's a 40 degree TD. So what's happening here is that this bypass line is coming over here to the headmaster, and it's reacting against that, the pressure of the, of the headmaster and, uh, in the head and allowing hot gas and liquid refrigerant to feed together into the receiver to maintain the higher pressure. Okay, let's look at that a little bit closer. What's happening here is we've got a 40 degree TD if we were to allow this to run without a headmaster, the, the head pressure would be a lot less than 196. It'd be the, the equivalent of 80 degrees. In other words, 60, uh, 60 degrees ambient plus 20 degrees TD is 80. So what's doing is maintaining 100, 100 degrees. Uh, it's taking out the condenser, telling it that you know it's actually you know 80 degrees out instead of being 60. But what's happening here is 196 pounds of discharge is coming down through this, through this little port, and it works against that nitrogen, and it modulates the amount of liquid refrigerant or hot gas that's being mixed with the liquid refrigerant and shoves this poppet a little bit tighter against that, uh, that seat, holding back a little bit of the liquid. When it holds back that liquid, you can see here that the liquid is starting to back up into the condenser. So what happens with this is as your condenser gets smaller, the amount of, of area that you're using to actually condense that refrigerant gets smaller and smaller. So it's derating the condenser and making it into a condenser that would run for 40 degrees TD. Now let's go to a cold day. It's minus 20. We've got 120 degrees TD. It's still 196 pounds per square inch high side coming over here, it's doing the same thing that it was doing before, and we still have 70 pounds on our low side. So 
looking at it closer, you really can't tell that much what's going on here, but it's really holding back on that liquid and it's feeding more hot gas. The liquid is super subcooled because it's minus 20. You still got a fan blowing on it. And you're only using maybe a tenth of the condenser to do your condensing. Almost all of it is liquid inside the condenser backing up that liquid. That's one of the, another thing that they call a headmaster is a flooded condenser valve. Uh, so anyway, that's how it works. Uh, maintains the pressure of a 100 degree day and or 80 degree day, excuse me. And uh, it's, it keeps your system running and keeps your expansion valves working at their optimum because expansion valves are supposed to run at a particular TD, they're, they're a pressure drop. They are sized by pressure drop and uh, Ed's gonna talk about that a little bit later on. But you have to maintain a high enough head pressure on the, on the inlet side of that expansion valve to be able to feed enough liquid to do your refrigeration and the evaporator. So the next thing is the receiver. The receiver's there to receive liquid from the condenser. Here's another thing about having a headmaster is, what's going on with your liquid refrigerant? When you're backing up that liquid refrigerant into the condenser, where's it coming from? Everything else, you've got a liquid line, you've got a liquid line going over here like this, you've got a vapor line coming back over here. The liquid that is filling this condenser is the liquid that's in the receiver. So one of the things when you apply a headmaster on a refrigeration system is you have to oversize the receiver so it can hold as much liquid refrigerant as that condenser can hold. So that in the summertime when it's, when it's using all the condenser for, for condensing, your liquid is, is the last few passes of that condenser, it's all gonna be in that receiver without overfilling it. So you have to oversize the receiver. Receivers are used with expansion valve uh, uh, systems. Uh, expansion valves react to changes in load, like Ed was talking about. The, uh, the evaporator, as you put, say, a, a bucket of hot soup in this walk-in, or you've got a couple people standing in there, uh, you know, that, uh, that load increases. As the load increases, this bulb gets a little warmer in it, it and it opens up the expansion valve a little bit more and feeds more refrigerant to handle that load. When it does that, that liquid refrigerant has to come from someplace, and it comes from the receiver. So the receiver level falls a little bit while that expansion valve is feeding more, and then when it gets satisfied, it comes back up, and it comes back up to its normal state. So, you know, liquid receiver is there for expansion valve systems. Um, Look at the bottom of the receiver. Look at this, this cutaway. This thing is actually laying on its side with the top towards us here. But you've got one long dip tube. That dip tube goes clear down to the bottom so it can pick up both oil and liquid refrigerant. So you don't log this whole thing with oil. And you've got just a stub sticking in there that's dropping the liquid refrigerant down in here so it can be picked up by the dip tube. But there's a third tube here. And what would you imagine that's, that would be for? Well, you know, I, I can't hear your answers, but I'll tell you it is for a pressure relief valve. When you have a large enough receiver with enough poundage in it, by code, you have to be able to vent that pressure relief outside. So you put a pressure relief on there that, that blows off the refrigerant to the roof or to the wall, outside the wall or whatever like that. It does two things. It saves firemen and it keeps them from getting uh, getting gassed because it, if they have a fire and, and this thing gets overheated, it can't explode if there's if there's nothing uh, no uh, pressure relief valve on it. So it's it's just a safety safety device. With capillary tubes, capillary tubes are another metering device between the high side and the low side that uh, that are they're different lengths or different diameters. The, it, it just is a fixed, like a fixed orifice in an air conditioning system. Uh, it's the longer the cap tube, the less flow goes through it, the shorter, the more. 
And of course, the larger, the more, and the smaller, the more. Uh, but they, they're they usually used in places where, like a domestic, domestic refrigerator, where um, you've got uh, a stable ambient around it, and you don't have a big change in load very often, so the cap tube catches up in its own good time. It doesn't need to be an expansion valve. You don't need to have a receiver with a condenser or with the cap tube because it just doesn't change the amount of flow rate. So you don't have to worry about that, uh, where you're going to get that additional refrigerant for handling higher loads. Now, liquid line filter dryers, number nine. Liquid line filter dryers. Um, they are there usually replaced by service technicians every time they open up the refrigeration system. They'll tell you that. They probably don't have that many on their truck. Um, the, uh, the, the dryer itself needs to be put onto a system anytime you open it up that the air is able to get to it, uh, get to the refrigeration system so it can dry that, that uh, moisture out of the system. Um, Here's a look at three filter dryers. Uh, there's a flare one on the left, there's a, there's a uh, sweat one on the right, and then there's this guy right here. Um, these are bad from the standpoint that there's nothing holding the beads in place. They have little beads of, of desiccant inside of them that picks up the moisture. Um, they work good for the first um, maybe year, and then and then they start to uh, fall apart. After you've had one of these in a system for a couple of years, you can uh, when they're new, you can pick one up and you can shake it. It's, it sounds like a maraca, you know. But uh, after a couple of years, all those beads have turbulated inside there, beat on each other, and turned into mush and gone to the compressor crankcase. So. You know, there's options that are better than this. Uh, Emerson makes an EKO32 SV cap for cap tube, and uh, Sporlin makes a CO32 SV cap. So, you know, basically you've got that three cubic inch filter dryer that you can use with a cap tube outlet for both, uh, or for these uh, cap tube applications. These are just for standard uh, standard refrigeration systems. This one has a quarter inch inlet and a cap tube outlet. So block style filter dryers, um, they, they can be uh, okay. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it does its job as far as moisture and acids are concerned. They have a pretty high acid capacity. As far as filtration is concerned, it, it doesn't take a very big, large amount of grit, of, uh, of dirt to plug these things because the, the dirt that's, that's coming downstream that these things are picking up, filtering out, whether it's welding scale or something like that from, you know, poor practices and brazing, um, that kind of stuff gets, gets down here and you just have square inches of area for things to stick onto. So it only takes a small amount of material and, and you start getting plugged up and the pressure drop goes up. Pressure drop is bad in a refrigeration system. If you look at a compacted bead style filter dryer like this, you've got cubic inches of, of uh, filtration on the inlet. The refrigerant and the dirt and everything else comes in through here. It's trapped by this 40 micron pad. And then you've got your beads are clean to do their job, which is pick up moisture and, and acids. And then there's a 20, 20 micron pad on the outlet. So, you know, the ultimate uh, uh, filtration on this is 20 micron. How do they compare? I, I just have to say these will, these will plug up faster. These will not. These will handle five times as much grit as these, these guys will. If there's a dirty system out there, a, a burnout where the windings have turned into smoke and, it, and that needs to be picked up, this is the guy to use right here. On a block style, like a heat pump style like this, um, I actually designed this back in 1977 for Sporlin Valve Company. Uh, but uh, these check valves, 
liquid comes in here, it goes through these outer check valves and then it dives through the core to the inner part and goes out through a check valve out the outlet. And then vice versa, when it comes in here, it goes through the outer check valve, dives through, and goes out through the center check valve here to go out to the other side. So that works in both directions. And the flow of refrigerant is always from the outside of the core to the inside of the core. Okay, um, next subject. We are doing pretty good in 907. Okay, solenoid valves. This is a solenoid valve in the liquid line of the system. And um, <clears throat> it's there for pump down situations. Pump down is uh, when you have a refrigeration system, uh, this this is a, the walk-in box is right here. This is, just say this is the walk-in box here, and uh, you know we have a box thermostat that's a uh, you know close on rise type uh, thermostat. So as the temperature rises in a room, of course it closes and we, and it energizes the solenoid valve, and the solenoid valve is open. And it feeds liquid refrigerant over here to the expansion valve, and the expansion valve feeds it to the evaporator, it picks up heat, takes it to the compressor, takes it over the condenser, and get, gets rid of it. That's the refrigeration cycle. Now, when that thermostat senses that the room is down to the proper temperature, 35 degrees, whatever it is, it's an open on fall. In other words, the temperature is going down. As soon as it gets down to the set point, it's going to open up. And when it opens up, these are normally closed solenoid valves. So when it open, opens up, it de-energizes the coil and allows the solenoid valve to close. When it closes, this compressor is still running. It's in a totally separate circuit than the, this internal part with the room thermostat and the solenoid valve. There's two, two distinct separate circuits. So what happens is, that solenoid valve closes, the compressor keeps pumping. As the compressor pumps, it pulls the liquid refrigerant out of the downstream side of the solenoid valve through the expansion valve. The expansion valve doesn't know any different. It just knows that it's getting refrigerant drawn through it. It pulls all the refrigerant or most of the refrigerant out of the low side of the system and stores it on the high side of the system in the receiver and in the condenser until we're ready to use it again. When it gets down to the cutout of the low pressure control, the compressor shuts off. So vice versa, we energize, close on rise, we get up to 38, 39 degrees. We energize the solenoid valve that allows refrigerant to come through and refrigerant comes through and it, and it runs through the expansion valve. The expansion valve doesn't know because it's just a mechanical device. And the pressure starts to rise in the suction line side of the system. When it gets to the cut in point of this low pressure switch, it turns on the compressor and you've got refrigeration. That's the pump down cycle. What it's good for is all of this, all of this refrigerant in this side of the system has an affinity for oil. It likes to go to the oil and in the off cycle, it will migrate to that oil and condense. When it does that, it dilutes the oil and causes bearing failures and things like this inside the compressor. So what we do is we just get as much of that refrigerant away from the oil as we can and store it up here. So we use a pump down cycle to do that. That's, that's totally different than what air conditioning does. Air conditioning is no solenoid valve. In essence, all you're doing is energizing your Y circuit. Y circuit hits contact or turns the compressor on. Simple. So if you look in, internally on a, on a solenoid valve like this, this is a direct acting solenoid valve, and, it, and it's direct acting in that this solenoid pulls on a plunger, and the plunger pulls a pin out of a hole, and the liquid refrigerant can go right through it like that. It just pulls it up. And uh, that these are limited to the size they can be because this, the size of the port can can't be very large because the larger the port is, the more pressure is being exerted on that on that pin to stay in the hole. And so you'd have to have a larger magnet, a larger larger uh, coil up here on top of the solenoid valve to pull that plunger out of the hole if the if the orifice was too large. 
So we have the maximum size, uh, just one size uh, for the direct acting solenoid valve. And they're uh, pretty much limited to maximum operating pressure differential, or MOPD. So when you've got 300 pounds on one side and 50 pounds on the other, you know, that's 250 pounds of pressure drop, or delta P, uh, you know, this valve's going to operate just fine. Over here, if you've got 400 pounds on the inlet side and zero on the outlet, that's 400 pounds. It's higher than the MOPD that the valve is meant to run at. So it's going to actually get stuck and not be able to work. So that leaves us with, if we only have one size of that solenoid valve, that direct acting solenoid valve, then we need to do something to make larger valves so we can work with larger systems. So in this, in this case, we've got a pilot operated valve. The pilot operated part is you've got liquid refrigerant coming in through here and it can fill around the base of this, this seat area and go up inside the enclosing tube next to the plunger. And liquid refrigerant sits in here while this thing is closed. And this is a direct acting solenoid valve on top of this piston. This piston itself has a hole through the middle. When you energize, liquid refrigerant can go through that hole in the middle, equalizing pressure from one side to the other, and the, the mass flow of the liquid refrigerant coming up here, pushing on that disc, makes it ride above the seat, and liquid refrigerant can flow through here to the downstream side. That's how a pilot operated valve works. When it wants to close, you de-energize it, it, sh it shuts the hole, but it shoves down on that, that piston and allows it to uh, stay closed. These are subject to a minimum operating pressure differential. If you get down too far in pressure differential, if you have zero pounds of pressure differential across this, you can't get it to stay open. Too large of a valve, is, the, is uh, that's what's going to happen. So it, it's like this. We make seven different sizes of 3-8 solenoid valve, and six of them are wrong for your application. You've got to be sure to have the right refrigerant, the right tonnage, and size these things out by the data that's on the outside of the box. Side glasses. Side glasses are there for a visual indication of the quality of the refrigerant inside that, that tube. In other words, uh, whether it's got bubbles in it or whether it's wet or dry, if you've got a wet or dry system. It has the capability of telling you whether it's wet or dry because of a ceramic wafer that's in the center of it. And these things should be applied a lot of guys say, well, I, I charged it until I had a full side glass. Well, a lot of times that side glass is down here just, just past the, expand, the uh, dryer. And that doesn't mean anything. All that, means is, all that means is it's full here, but what about all this pressure drop that's going on all out here? Side glasses should be installed as close to the expansion device as possible so you can check the quality of the refrigerant where it makes the most sense. So it's important to know the, the moisture level of the refrigerant and, and the oil that's, that's flowing around the system because, you know, the new refrigerants, the HFCs, require POE or, or polyester oil uh, to operate. In other words, if you had mineral oil in an HFC, there's nothing in the HFC. There's no uh, uh, chlorine molecule to carry that mineral oil around, POE with HFCs, um, it has an affinity for one another and they all move together. So, you know, POE is, uh, is important for the application of HFC refrigerants, but it has a problem. The problem is it drinks too much. It's uh, 12, it, it's sitting in a bucket, it'll hit 1,200 parts per million by itself where mineral oil and alkabenzene barely take on any water at all. So, you know, they, the, uh, uh, the oil absorbs the, all that moisture until it gets up to about 1,200 parts per million in stasis. So what is a POE? Well, P 
PoE is the hydrolysis of esters. In other words, when you look at that, it's alcohol and acid combined together. That sounds like a party from the 70s, doesn't it? Uh, and it comes up with ester oil and water. Okay, the, the process can be reversed by reintroducing that water back into the ester oil. In other words, just like in the system, if it gets wet, if it gets moisture in it, it's going to break down that, that oil, and it turns back into its component parts, alcohol and acid. The alcohol is not an issue. It's going to be picked up by desiccant. Acid has to be picked up by desiccant, but not too much. Okay, so that's the importance of having the proper filter dryer in the system when you do this kind of stuff. So just as an example of, of what, uh, what size or how, how much uh, oil is in a pound of, of, uh, of oil, how much moisture is in a pound of oil, it only takes 1.4 drops of water to cause acid in the oil. So that's not much in a half horse condensing unit. You got one and a half pounds of, of oil charge. 1.4 drops is not much at all, and uh, that can be picked up very easily with the filter dryer, the proper filter dryer. So when you look at the options you have, you have a side glass here that you'll be able to see moisture going, or see your liquid refrigerant going through there, and also this center piece here is the part that changes color. It changes from the salmon color through purple to blue to show the indicating levels. On a sporlin, there's only one color change. That color changes from yellow to green. It doesn't get any greener. It doesn't get any yellower. Dan Foss, same way. Parker's got a blue color to theirs. Now, when you look at their capabilities, the fact of the matter is PoE oil at 75 parts per million starts to, starts to break down and create acids. Okay? you want to maintain your oil at less than 50 parts per million. So at 75 degrees of 134A, we can look at this and see the color changes of the Emerson product down to 25 parts per million. That's, that's an indicating level that's about half of what you, you, you really need for 50 parts per million. The green ones, the green ones, yellow to green change occurs about 120 parts per million and it doesn't get any greener. So there's, there's one reason that you should be probably looking at, uh, at a side glass. And uh, I, that pretty much does me um, as far as my side. I'm working on the high side of the system. So it's, uh, it's either Ed's turn or we're just gonna take some time for some, uh, some questions. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Um, I actually just uh, posted a message out there to the chat that you would be wrapping up your presentation and we were going to open it up to questions. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and tr try to unmute everybody in case there are any questions. Um, so let's see how that goes and how much feedback we get. Yeah. yeah. Customers are getting nervous, they're you know, getting no calls. Is there anyone that has any questions? Is, is there any um, questions is Larry out there? Ever so, so, okay. I, can, I, can <laughs> I think I heard a question. It's like, he's, again. it's like he's got to get to that spot. Is that possible? Hear me? So, so I got a not. question for you, Kevin. Uh, for the yes. class, HMI site class, <laughs> I had some customers uh, say that. Right. Uh, they pulled an evacuation down below 500 microns, but then they had to run the system for 12 or 24 hours to turn it blue. Have you heard of this before? Uh, well, yeah, it does. It doesn't change immediately. It's. it's uh, I. I haven't seen 24 hours though. It's more like about just by the end of the day, it'll change the color. Okay, do we have documentation that says that? Uh, that would be something for Mr. Hagel to answer. I haven't seen that. Okay. Thank by, you. by experience, I know that it's been about eight, eight hours uh, and it changes as far as it's going to go. Jim Hagel, I know you are on. I don't know if uh, you have any comments on that. I unmuted you. I have a question too. 
I am here. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Jim. Yeah, because our because our moisture indicator does detect all the way down at three percent, it does take longer to get back to its strike um, dry uh, to show it that it's dry. So it, it definitely it is some what some people consider it uh, uh, negative about the thing about the moisture indicator, but longer. Um, do we have? Uh, definite documentation on that. I think the law system is kind of sure so we don't really have much as far as documentation on that. Thing. Thank you, Jim. Was there another question? Yeah, I have one if you have time. Sure, absolutely. Sure. Go ahead. Hey, hey Ed, this is Don. Hey, listen, uh, that 2.4 drops of moisture is that based on like per pound? I mean, does that change? How does that 2.4 drops if the system's larger uh, or what's that based on? Okay, that's uh, that was me. And basically we're looking at an oil charge of one pound or one and a half pounds. And it, it uh, in order to get that 1.4 drops of water, it's, uh, you know, per pound, uh, basically one, one drop per pound. Um, there's another chart that I can show. See if I can get out of this. And we would base that on the oil charge on that condensing unit. There, there you go. Yeah, I, I didn't catch that, Ed. I, I just saw it now, Ed. I, I, uh, I missed that the first time around, Kevin. Yeah, I've got a chart on that I can send to you, Don. That's fine. I, I, yeah, if you could, that'd be great. You, you, you already kind of answered my question. I missed that 1.5 pounds on there. I appreciate it, guys. Great job. 